Eventually, Art I'll put. <laughs> I <laughs> guess. Icicles. I'm uh I'm sipping on your uh the most humble pie from Pontoon. This is from you, right? Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. I am drinking. Uh, what am I drinking? I saw I'm that koozie. Uh, Franco nice. Crisp from Southern Grist. It's their uh, yes. French Pilsner that they just did. Yeah. Very nice. And my Love it. <laughs> Freaking love it. You know, and like stop with the noises over there. I guess Sorry. we're not. Are well, I mean, we could be mic? recording. Depends on when we start. You ready? <laughs> we have your facial expressions now. We have your facial expressions now. So, all of the wacky stuff that you do. All right. Um, That's disappointing. Like personally. <laughs> we. I was thinking we should do this like for all of them. Just like have it on our face so that when we do. Stupid Something shit. like <laughs> get like the actual reactions and put them out like with clips and stuff. Be a lot know. better for your TikTok clips. Yeah, right. <laughs> all the face chat and the scribbly groups. line over the uh, logo is doing it, eh? It's yeah, bringing in the yeah. views. <laughs> <laughs> Just the Fuck you. Ass facial expression. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> People oh, as if we didn't get like not enough views that our facial expressions will really turn them off. It's tough. <laughs> Just in case our voices weren't objectionable enough, check these yeah. haggard mugs out. Did you guys I just want to make sure, did you guys add Questions and stuff, all of that in the thing. I don't know if you, you don't have to, but it's in the. I know Big Daddy has trouble finding our Every time. sheet that hasn't changed. The location hasn't changed. And well, to be fair, I deleted it the first two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> You're such defense. an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do we get along or what? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Brad's like fuck. New dynamic with a different co host. Like I just remembered I have plans. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Feeling lucky. Episode 34. Let's go. You've got to ask yourself one question. We are back with another episode of the Feeling Lucky Podcast, presented by Hops News. I am lucky, and to my bottom left, I guess. I don't know how this is going to turn out. <laughs> In the bottom left tile of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> JJ. Very different. Somewhere episode. on your screen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and my left tile is Big Daddy. And boy, do we have a special guest tonight. We have one of our favorites, one of the OGs. Uh, Mr. Brad Eldridge Smith from Common Law Brewing. Brad, how you doing? Good, man. Good. I haven't been on in a while. It's good to see you. I think I uh, I told I told Big Daddy to go back and listen to our first episode that we did together, but <laughs> I realized that it was before we actually became like a true podcast. What just happened? Is this <laughs> someone? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be an issue. <laughs> well, I, I don't like, know. I was like ready to put my hands in the air, like. <laughs> oh, um, kind of, looks like we're taking like class outside or something. Yeah, honestly, like, I like just... whole philosophy professor that like <laughs> just... wanted to have class. That's kind of what this looks like. That could be. I mean, that could be what this is. But anyway, Brad, you were you were just a YouTube. <laughs> This is already off to a terrible start, guys. We have a guest. <laughs> My God, we're in <laughs> Who was that? I was like, that was me. Oh, I thought, you're so dumb. You know how on like uh, Microsoft Teams you can like switch your own view? So I definitely thought it was just going to be me, and now it throws us all into another world. <laughs> oh. Here, let's all Brady Bunch us again, all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh. This is gonna be a 
long night. <laughs> All right, fuck. Got to bring it back. Got to bring it back. Should we just restart? I don't know. I don't know. Oh my god. All right. I switched mine, so I don't know why everyone else is still. Mine. I'm still sitting. I yeah, I had to go I'm change kidding. mine back to grid view to get it. <laughs> to get it. All right. Well. <laughs> Anyway, Brad, we're <laughs> back and we're very happy to have you. We have you on because you are the oh my god, the virtual tasting, the virtual tour, virtual tasting tour this month for yep. Hops News. Um, before we get started, you were a part of the first one, the first ever one that we did with Boonshine. Yeah. Wanted to ask you what you thought. And it was it was awesome. It was um you know, I'd never had any beer from them before. Um, okay. So obviously getting to try some beer from them was really exciting. Um, and it was very good beer. Um, I really like the the hatchet, the coffee porter that yeah, they that had. Yeah, that was the coffee um, one. That's a really solid coffee porter. But, um, you know, I, di- I didn't really know what to expect from the share itself. Because um, yeah. obviously, like, we've done virtual shares and we've done, you know, presidential debate drinking games and yeah. <laughs> stuff where we've just like had people on just drinking and getting hammered. Mm-hmm. But that was really the first one where it was like, you know, you guys have had guests on where it's a, a brewery owner or a head brewer or whatever talking mm-hmm. about beer. But usually we're just watching that on, you know, Facebook video or YouTube or whatever, and we're not participating in it. And so it was kind of cool to actually be able to like really engage with Nick and ask questions and, hear his perspective um for sure you know it's, it's always cool to get the perspective of people that are inside you know decent sized breweries like that and running it on a day-to-day basis so i thought yeah. it was i thought it was a lot of fun i said i think i said it on this podcast i don't know if i said it on happy hour but i thought it was the most intimate like beer tour that i've ever been on truly like yeah i don't remember a time where i could like literally ask any questions that i wanted and talk to everybody at the same time i thought it was very cool but i'm glad you enjoyed it yeah it was it was awesome man and he was um you know nick was super cool too because i think jay had told him like an hour and <laughs> i think he was with us for like two and a half hours my um, so my computer died time. at two hours yeah literally i was on it for two hours and my computer died so it's yeah. awesome yeah he was cool i liked it a lot um just i i, I was gonna have you on to promote it for Hops News, but I found out last night that there are no more people that are allowed to come in. So this is going to be, I guess, just making people jealous. But what beers are you sending? Yeah, so, put out a uh, graphic. Yeah, so we are actually we're doing four beers. Um, the the initial plan was for three, um, and and the listing that uh, Jay Brew put out still has three on it. So um, okay. I'll go through those. I'll go through those three first, and then we'll tease what the fourth one is. So. The first one even, does Jay even know that there's four? Because I'm pretty sure he's said every time that there's three. Yeah, I I just kind of <laughs> like snuck a fourth one in there. <laughs> so, Shame on you! Oh my yeah, god, extra Unreal. beer! God, what a terrible <laughs> person I am. Um, but yeah, so the the first one in the box um, is called Rule of Law. It's our golden ale. Um, yep. So it's just a traditional British golden ale. It's a nice light colored malty beer, super easy drinking, about five and a half percent. Um, we hop ours a little differently. Um, it's hopped with a bunch of like citrus forward North American hops um, and yeah. some New Zealand hops. So gives it a little bit of a, a nice finish, um, almost gives it a nice sweet citrus finish to it. So it's kind of one of our core beers. Um, it's one you'll see on rotation with us pretty frequently. So okay. um, wanted to include something in there that wasn't like crazy off the wall experimental um, that everybody right. could actually like taste and be like, okay, this is a beer that they're going to have on some sort of regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, the second beer that's in there is a Belgian dark um, called No Precedent. Um, so if if you like Belgian beers, um, you know, kind of that estery profile that they have to them, that little bit of, you know, the hint of banana. And, yeah. um, you know, so with a Belgian dark, you get um, some additional flavors in there. You get like some fig and um, some darker fruit, a little bit more of a caramel malty kind of taste. So um, usually provides a really nice balance. That beer is about nine and a half percent. <laughs> so it is that one that will uh, it will get the party started right. That's <laughs> um, I say we're in for a hell of a night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're four beers, there, right? Yeah, we we may need two hours for this one just to like actually make it through all the beer. Right. Um, 
but yeah, so that that one, um, really good beer. Um, you know, throwing something Belgian in there kind of mm. helps to to throw some new flavors into the package. Um, and then the last beer that's part of the like announced package or whatever that that Jay Brew did <clears throat> is a beer called Offshore Accounts, um, which actually originated on another Hops News family mm-hmm. podcast. So it, it came out of Hops Geek News. Yep. Um, so I did an episode with um, with Mash and Hoppy talking about super beers. And we yeah. essentially, they gave me a list of superheroes and I did some themed beers based around those superheroes. Mm-hmm. Um, and Offshore Accounts is the name of it now, but it was the beer that was the Aquaman yes. um, concept beer. So um you know i kind of the same spiel i gave them so you know the first thing that i thought when mash told me aquaman was well it's got to be a goza because it's got to have salt in it Um, it, 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 it's aquaman like it's the ocean (laughs) it's got to have salt um and then the the next thing that popped into my head and don't ask me why but um so aquaman the the actual normal guy behind aquaman the character's name is arthur curry and so i was like hmm curry that I could put some curry in a goza. <laughs> okay. um, and so that slowly developed into this idea for a goza that had um, toasted and raw coconut, yeah. lime zest, and a little bit of sweet Indian curry in it. Yeah. Um, and man, it, I was a little scared when we made it. I'll, I'll be honest, because it's one of those, <laughs> like, there are occasions where, like, I make a beer where I'm like, I'm flipping a coin here. There's right. like a 50% chance that this beer is going to be completely undrinkable. Yep. And there's a 50% chance that it's going to be awesome because it's going to be really unique and have something yep. cool about it. Um, this was definitely one of those beers. Um, and so now it's done. Um, it's carbonating right now. Um, but it's really good. <laughs> nice. I was actually really happy with the way it turned out. So it's nice, subtle curry flavor. We didn't do yeah. a ton of curry in it really coconut forward got a nice lime finish to it got the nice saltiness um, that you would expect out of it goza so i think you guys are going to be really impressed with that one it's only about 4.2 percent um which we'll is that after the nine goza. and a half you're gonna need that after that nine and a half healthy balance that's what we promote here <laughs> yeah and then and then the fourth beer that i'm sneaking in i'm not going to spoil the uh you know, spool it. I, I want everybody to just kind of open the box and be surprised, but yep. it's another, uh, it's another double. So it's, um, a, a close to 8% beer. Um, and it's, yeah. and it's another one that's a, um, when we talk about the beer as part of the share, people are yep. going to be like, Holy shit. I've never had what, anything that sounds like <laughs> this. It's going to be, it's going to be a really uh, unique beer for you guys to try. So I'm excited about, uh, Excited about you guys getting that chance. And then all of the boxes will have um, one of our T-shirts in them. So either yep, yep. the gray one that I've got on or we've got a yellow one and a blue one. Um, we'll throw some stickers and shit in there, um, you know, for the for the people that are in the, you know, in the inner circle. Um, yep. You know, there, there might be a couple extra beers in there as well. Whatever I can fit inside yeah. that box. <laughs> I'm so ex- I'm so, so, so excited. So, I mean, I I up my membership just for this brand. Yeah. So that's you called me out hard in front of the fans. So yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah was there was like, an announcement. Man, that's that's crazy. They announced that I'm going to be the next virtual share, and then all of a sudden, like, three more people joined the <laughs> Super Friendship level. Like, I see what you're up to here, guys. I see yep. No, and then yeah, surprisingly, the... this morning that one more joined last night, and he was like, do, do, we, do you have oh, enough beer for it? And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Shout out Patrick. Um, he's a good yep. guy, but he did say he was uh, thinking about joining, so I – think now that brings us down to maybe two spots at the sip of sunshine level so you can't get into the common law one but you can get into the next one and this is hopefully going to be the norm for all of the places um that we do so i'm super excited about it we obviously love you and the one thing i will say is um my brewery tour will not be nearly as cool as because my brewery is not like 15,000 square feet. Um, <laughs> my brewery is my garage. So yeah. you guys can go like sit in the garage with me and you can see what beer looks like at the the, the micro scale yeah, um, for sure. level, which I think a lot of you guys, if you've been around for a few months, have probably seen the inside yeah. of my garage before. Because <laughs> right? um, I know I've done like bottle shares and all sorts of stuff where I've been out yeah. like canning beer while I was talking to you guys. So for um, sure. That's the other thing that you will get out of the common law beers. Um, Mark and I can every single one of those beers by hand. 
Um, they do not go through a machine. They go through, we essentially have a little can seamer that's like a growler machine at a brewery. We fill the can, put the top on it, seam it by hand. All the labels go on by hand. Um, and you guys are going to get the, you all will be the first group to get our new labels. Nice. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That, I think. To a full color, full wrap label. So I've actually got the. Uh, the oh, baby. Here. Hey, hey, that is awesome. I'm so excited. It's gorgeous. Very cool. Well, we're going to get into common law a little bit more. Do you have an update on when the tap room is opening? Because I think last time you were still working on that. Yeah. Has so we've, been, we've I know got you guys our, got one, right? Yeah, we've got our lease and everything signed now. All of our equipment's on order. Um, we've been meeting with contractors to start the construction process and our, our build out of the tap room. Um, right now we're anticipating probably like late summer, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in like the August, September timeframe. Um, obviously if equipment comes in a little sooner, maybe it goes a little quicker. Um, you know, if we start to do our permitting and it's taken forever with the federal government, cause it's the federal government, <laughs> it may be a little later than that, but that's the target right now is kind of that late summer, early fall. Um, so, you know, hopefully right in time for football season, um, we'll oh, be able baby. to, uh, to open up and and get going um you know we we had hoped to be open sooner than that but you know all the shit with covid and then trying to find the right location and you know just trying to get everything set up um you know was was not an easy task and then when we were finally able to be like okay we think we know where we're going we're going to put our equipment order in when we had initially talked to them about equipment they had quoted us six to eight weeks for equipment mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, yeah, by the way, we've got a ton of back orders right now. So it's 12 to 14 weeks instead of six to eight. I'm like, yeah. OK, that's, that's just an extra <laughs> like month and a half. That's no big deal. Yeah. Um, so we're still waiting on um, equipment to come in. It's all on order. Um, everything is is in process. Um, it's just a matter of waiting for it to show up. And so in the interim, we're going to go ahead and start doing some of the build out for our tap room. Um, you know, get the place painted, get the bar installed, get the walk in yeah. cooler installed. Um, get our water lines roughed into the right spots and all that good stuff so that when equipment shows up, all they got to do is come back in and finish it. And then once that's done, I can do all my permitting and everything and we'll be ready to uh, to start brewing big batches of beer. I'm sick of brewing little batches of beer. <laughs> I want to brew lots of beer, man. Yeah. So that's kind of when I was uh, coming up with questions for this, um, me, JJ and Big Daddies might differ a little bit in there. We have a lot of listener questions, so we'll nice. get into all of that stuff. Um, but when I was, I think we talked about this, maybe me and Brad used to, when we used to do the after hours for the hoppy hour, me and Brad would stay up to the wee hours of the morning almost and uh, just talk, uh, talk shop and stuff like that. So a lot of the questions were, are kind of, for me anyway, are going to be kind of based around like starting a brewery. Cause we talked to sure. lots of breweries and stuff like that, but you're in obviously the, I guess you're further along than like the ground ground level, but I kind of, I'm super curious as to how all of that came about. Um, so I guess my first question would be like, um, get, how do you go from your background? You were a lawyer. That's the common law, mm -hmm. how all of that stuff, you want, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I don't know that we've talked about that on feeling lucky in particular. Yeah. I, I can. Yeah. The, so yeah, that's the, the background for the name. Um, so I went, I went to law school, um, at the university of Tennessee, um, practiced law for a few years. Um, after I got out of school, did mostly criminal defense work, um, a little bit of family law, um, all the things that just drain your soul from your body. <laughs> you're doing them. Um, so yeah, Happy knows all about that. Yeah, if you're listening right now, kids don't go to law school. <laughs> um, and so ended up making a made a career transition. Um, so I've been in project management, IT project management for the last probably eight or nine years now. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, working for mostly healthcare companies in the the Nashville area. So that's my day job now. Um, is is I'm a project manager for a healthcare company, um, which is nice though because my whole job revolves around planning out these like multi million dollar projects. Right. Um, so opening a brewery felt easy because it's <laughs> a little lower budget than most of the projects I run yeah. at work. Um, and it's still somebody else's money, thankfully. So, um, you know, it, it feels very natural to me. But um, but yeah, so that's where the that's where the common law name came from. And honestly, when we were looking at names, um, we we brainstormed 
probably 25 or 30 names. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we shortlisted that down to about 15. Yeah. And then we actually did um, like branding, like rough branding and logo concepts for like five or six of them okay. um, before we kind of found like, here's what we think fits with what we want to do beer wise. Here's what we think the the community will get a kick out of. Um, and common law has been fun because it's one of those phrases that like when people hear it, they've heard that phrase before. For sure. They may not know what common law means, but like they've at least heard the phrase common law. Um, and so it immediately has a familiarity to people. Mm-hmm. And then we've used it to, you know, do beer names that have some legal relation, but they have, yeah. you know, some funny stuff or a little. I pun. love the puns. I love the puns. Um, you know, I, I'm a dad. I got two kids. I'm all about <laughs> dad jokes, man. If I can see <laughs> dad jokes in the names of beers, like yep. that's that's the kind of aesthetic that I'm looking for in my brewery. <laughs> I just I don't know that my brain works like that because when you are Hoppy and um Hoppy and Mash were talking about uh the episode before it came out and um throwing around name ideas. Whoever yeah. came up with offshore accounts, was it you? Yeah, that was me. That's I mean that's so perfect for <laughs> Aquaman and like common law. It's just I just I don't think my brain works like that. I could have never came up with that name. I don't think, but yeah, and and I've I'll be honest, some of those that one I did come up with myself, but we've also yeah. crowdsourced some of those names. Okay. So occasionally, like I'll throw a post up on Facebook or Instagram that's yep. just like, hey, give me your best funny legal related beer name. Yeah, um, and we've actually we've used several of them. Um, really? So like our rotating sour series that we do is called Tart Reform. Um, that was one that, (laughs) um, you know, by somebody on, I think Facebook, um, you know, that, that suggested that name. And then like our, um, new England IPA series is called Supreme court juiced us. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So we've got all sorts of, and, and most of them are like, they're fun. You know, we definitely have some that are just like core, like legal terms and stuff like that. Just because they have a, they usually have a backstory behind them. So even with like rule of law, our golden L, the whole yeah. reason that that one came up is because it's a golden, it's the golden rule. Yeah, the golden rule. Um, yeah. You know, and so there was like there was a thought process behind it. Um, you know, definitely not as funny as some of the other ones we have, yeah. um, but all of them have some sort of little story behind them. Yeah, that's awesome. So getting more into the background. So at what point do you decide you you've got a you've got a team or a guy that you're partnered with or a couple guys. Yeah, I've got two partners. Um, so Mark um, is my kind of longest term partner. Yep. Um, I see Mark him and a lot I, in the hops. Yeah, stuff. Mark and I have been brewing together for um, about two years, and that's really where like the core concept came from. Um, so I had already been thinking about doing something like this anyway, yep. um, and then when Mark and I started brewing together, we realized pretty quickly that one, we get along with each other really well. Um, but two, we have kind of complementary skill sets. Okay. Um, you know, so in brewing or just in life, both. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so you know, when it when it comes to beer, like I, I mean, you know, me, lucky, I'm I'm a very experimental guy. Like yes, I'm the guy sure. who's like, can I get curry into a goat? <laughs> uh, you know, and you can, can make, folks. You can, can I make folks. England IPA with Fruit Loops in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking to do. Um, sure. Whereas. Mark likes to do that stuff and he enjoys drinking those beers, but Mark is also at heart a beer purist. Like he's yeah. all about, can we make a great red L? Can we make a great pell L? Is our pell L nice and clear? Like yeah. what's the clarity of our beer look like? And so he brings a focus on some of the core styles and like the fine details to make sure that our beer, you know, looks and tastes fantastic. Yep. And then I bring, you know, kind of that element of creativity, a little bit of the, you know, kind of the fun background to it. So we complement each other nicely there. And then, you know, on the kind of brewery and business side of things. So obviously I've got a legal background. I've also got an MBA, so I've got a, a business and finance background. Um, but then Mark works in sustainability um, for the state. So he's got an operations and sustainability background. Um, and so he and I kind of mesh well on the business side of things too, because I can take care of a lot of the front of house and kind of businessy stuff. And then he can take care of some of the core operations, kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it works out really well. And then we've got a third partner, Sammy. Um, Sammy is our uh, honorary quality control guy. 
Okay. Um, which means he gets to drink all the beer. Um, and Sammy is also uh, part of the money behind the okay. um, venture. So yep. he is our uh, he is our principal investor. Um, and we met him through a mutual connection and kind of it's one, one of those where like you meet people and you know instantly you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be good for it with this person. <laughs> like we knew as soon as we met Sammy, we literally we cracked a beer open with him at 815 in the morning in a coffee. Oh, jeez. Love um, it. <laughs> like this we, guy, this guy's here to have fun. <laughs> That's awesome. So kind of piggybacking off of all that. Um the next question. So you said Sammy's a part of the money behind it. We mm-hmm. talked a little bit personally about like, um, you have you have investors. You started out, or like you were able to get investors and all of that stuff. How? Talk a little bit about like the sales pitch that you have and the business plan, and like that kind of ties into one of the other questions of the location. You're not in Nashville. You're a little bit outside. But yeah. I thought I remember, if I remember correctly, there's like reasoning behind that and all of that. So get into that a little bit if you could. Yeah. So when we first, so Mark and I first started discussing this idea and we're like, man, we think we can do this from a beer perspective. Like mm-hmm. we think our beer is good enough. We think people will show up and buy our beer. So then we started looking at, okay, how much money do we need? You know, what does it yeah. actually take realistically to do this from a financial perspective? Um, and so we started with kind of three different concepts. Um, We started a, we're going to do a small neighborhood brewery in the small town that we live in, or we're going to do a small neighborhood brewery in a neighborhood in Nashville and get it closer into the city. Or we're going to go like full on, you know, open on a 15 barrel system, you know, start canning essentially right off the bat and try to go like, you know, impact brewery within the yeah. national market. Um, and so we essentially did business plans for all of those, of uh, mm-hmm. what it would look like from a cost perspective, you know, what it would look like from, uh, you know, what equipment do we need? How much space do we need? You know, what kind of staff do we need? Do we need to bring on additional partners to help even out the workload? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we put a lot of effort into it. And we actually got to the point where we went and looked at um, a 10,000 square foot warehouse, um, right outside of downtown Nashville, um, and talk to the people about it. The group that owned it was willing to come in as an, an investor, um, to essentially offset the cost of the lease. And, uh, so, you know, we had a really good opportunity where we're like, okay, we've got most of the money lined up to do this. Mm -hmm. This, this would be, you know, big time brewery right off the bat. Um, and Mark and I sat down and talked about it and it just, it didn't feel like us, mm-hmm. um, you know, Mark and I both got our start as home brewers. We're both, you know, comfortable brewing out of a garage with five or six people hanging out with us and, and drinking our beer. And to us, it was really more about, you know, can we do something that we would want to go hang out at? Um, mm-hmm. and Mark and I, neither one are, are kind of go hang out at the, you know, the massive brewery, you know, yeah. all on a Saturday anymore. We both have kids. Um, we're both a little more family focused. And so we're like, okay, we're, we're going to do something smaller. Um, and then it really came down to, okay, are you going to do something small in Nashville or are you going to do something small in Spring Hill? Um, Mm -hmm. we are, and that's where like the demographics and everything came in. So we started looking at, okay, Nashville's already got, you know, X number of breweries by the time we open, it'll probably have X plus two. Um, whereas Spring Hill, no breweries at all, you know, obviously smaller area, but, the demographics, you know, if you look at what the craft beer industry is driven by, <laughs> the craft beer industry is driven by what you see on your screen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, white dudes between yeah. 25 and 40 that have like white collar jobs and make these. Yes. Money. This is what drives yep. the craft beer industry from a, from just a market share standpoint. For sure. Um, and so when we started looking at like the demographics of the area that we're in, you know, the average person in Spring Hill is like a 37 year old white guy with 1.8 kids who makes 110 grand a year. Yeah. Um, and so we're like, oh, well, there's Boy, our people. Does he, have, does he have like, does he have a, have a big beard and stuff too? And like yeah. long hair and all of that <laughs> looks and, exactly yeah. like the guy walking into a brewery. Yeah. And so, you know, when we started looking at it, we're like, man, how is how has nobody done this? Like this yep. seems like an absolute no brainer. And so like we wrote our business plan. And we reached out to a a consultant um, that specializes in brewery openings 
just to make sure that there wasn't like something we had missed where we mm -hmm. were like, you know, we were like, man, this looks really good. We got to be missing something. Like if it were this right. good, somebody would already done it. We've got to be missing something. So we reached out to this guy and had him review our business plan and everything. And like his only feedback was, you guys are way underestimating how much beer you're going to sell. You're actually <laughs> busier than you think you're going to be. Yeah. We're like, oh shit. Yeah. Um, and so that's when we realized like, man, maybe we've kind of struck something here where this city really needs something like this and doesn't have anything to kind of fill the gap. And it's a, a population that's kind of ready and willing to take it on. Mm -hmm. We could be the ones to do this. And, and then that's when we said, okay, that's the path we're taking. No big brewery, no small brewery in Nashville. We're going small brewery, Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we finished out our business plan um, and started essentially um, first working with the city, um, honestly. So we called the mayor's office and said, hey, we're going to open a brewery in your city. We'd love to schedule time to sit down and talk to the mayor about it. Yeah. Um, and he called us back that day and was like, let's meet for coffee tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, like super excited about it because to him, he was like, you know, I've been pushing, you know, our director of economic development to bring something like this to Spring Hill for 10 years. Yeah. Um, and it just never happened. So like now you guys are doing it. We will give you whatever support you need. Um, and then we just started looking around. You know, they always tell you when you start any kind of business, but it's especially true with breweries. Um, your money should come primarily from the three F's, family, friends, and fools. Um, <laughs> and, and so first we hit family, then we hit up friends, and then we were like, who do we know that's just crazy enough? that Yep, they Sammy, support? and then Sammy like, came in, right? And then that's how we met Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out, Sammy. I want to meet this guy. That's Maybe. awesome. To me, it, like... Uh, it just... It, this is... It's a fascinating conversation to me, and I want to have it because, like, I... We, I think everybody that probably is listening to this podcast at some point has been drinking beer and like thought to themselves or with their buddies, like, dude, we could totally, like, we could totally just start a brewery or something like that. But it's like, it's interesting to see the actual thought process that goes into it. And like, I've always thought in the back of my head, being from Milwaukee, any brewery that basically starts in Milwaukee isn't going to fit. Like, why wouldn't, like, every, I haven't known of any to, go out of business during covid and if they mm -hmm. haven't now you know when is that going to happen but like the idea of taking it to like i like my dad's a beer drinker like my family's a beer drinker but they don't live in milwaukee and they don't go to the city too often he would kill to have a brewery like in his backyard or something like that so it's exactly. it's a super good idea and i love talking to you about it so like you're going to be small scale to start out at any point do you see yourself going bigger into that 10,000 square foot facility? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> to be honest. And, and really it's at, at this point, it, it looks like it's more of a, a market driven thing rather yep. than necessarily what Mark and I think we have to do with the brewery. Right. So um, we're going to open on a, a three and a half barrel um, system which is, you know, relatively small system, but we're in a, a small city. Um, it, but the thing that we've realized is as we started to put feelers out in the community and went and talked to restaurants and said, hey, we're opening a brewery. You guys have draft beer. You know, how would you feel about having us on tap, um, you know, once we get open? And, you know, we went to, you know, normally you'd do some stuff like that and you'd go to 10 restaurants and maybe a couple of them would be like, yeah, bring me a keg. We'll throw you on once and see if it works. And yeah. uh, so that's kind of what we were expecting is like this huge miss rate and just a handful of people saying yes to us because we're kind of the new kids on the block. And For sure. what we realized pretty quickly is that literally every single restaurant we went to was telling us yes. And some of them were telling us not only yes, but we'll take two to three taps of your beer because we'd oh, like to have a so core cool. beer that people can drink. Plus we'd like to have some of your experimental stuff. Right. Um, so just I like mean, rotating we, taps or something like that. Yeah. I mean, we even had a restaurant that didn't serve draft beer that we went to pitch them cans that was like, you know, could you guys give us some information on like putting in like a two tap kegerator that <laughs> draft beer off of. And so like, Dang, I mean, we've gotten awesome. just this massive, you know, response from, from people and, you know, a lot of opportunities to kind of partner. Um, we had a restaurant chain that we went and talked to that they do a lot of whiskey. 
Mm -hmm. Um, they do barrel pick whiskeys and so they'll go and they'll pick their barrel and you know the distillery bottles the whiskey for them but the restaurant chain gets to keep the barrel Um, so what they're wanting to do is instead of having the barrel shipped to them they're wanting to have the barrel shipped to us us fill that with a you know a big stout or a belgian strong or you know something that would age really well in a barrel Mm -hmm. and then pull that beer off and put the beer on draft at their restaurants alongside the whiskey picks themselves um you know so we'll have some that's so so awesome yeah we'll have some cool opportunities to do stuff like that um there's a live music venue that's opening real close to us pretty Mm -hmm. soon um, that's already uh, attracting a lot of attention. We went and met with them last week and they're wanting to see about potentially doing a kind of a private branded beer just for them um, that we would brew, but literally the only place you'd be able to buy it would be in their venue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've got some cool opportunities to do some things like that, that we honestly never thought we would get. Well, I mean, we thought we were going to open this small tap room and like, you come in there on a Saturday night and there'd be like 18 people hanging out with us. And it's probably the same 18 people that were in there last weekend, but like <laughs> it's enough for us to be able to like afford to make beer and keep the life, sure. like have some fun with it. Yep. Uh, and we've realized pretty quickly that like, you know, just based on what it looks like we're going to do from a restaurant sales perspective, we're already almost at capacity for our system. <laughs> um, and we're, and we're six months away from being open. Um, okay, so it, I told, um, actually I had this conversation with Sammy probably two weeks ago. I said, look, I'm going to get this thing open and, you know, we're going to get it, get it built out. We're going to get it licensed. We're going to get it open. We're going to start serving beer. As soon as I get past our grand opening and I can take a breath, I'm immediately going to start looking at what our expansion plan yeah. is because we're going to, we're going to need it. We're not going to have time to sit around on it. Um, and so, you know, the ideal thing would be, you know, us to build a, a nice standalone building that's custom made for a brewery kind of yeah. right near a town and become a focal point. And that's kind of what the city wants to is for us to become a focal point in the downtown yeah. area. So um, that will probably be phase two. Um, phase two might also include a distillery side. Oh, um, also. God, Brad. Gonna fuck around and move to Spring Hill real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a cool city. You are the demographic. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You are, man. Um, no, I. Uh, that's so awesome. I love that. Uh, it seems like uh, you I can't even call it a problem. It's like a good problem or good, good, something that you have to look forward to. Yeah. So you kind of already answered this next question. And JJ and Big Daddy, please feel free to jump in with any questions that aren't on on the list or not related. Um, but my next, so you kind of already answered it, but I, like, you've done a really good job building. I have in quotes, the hype before Mm -hmm. opening. So how have you done that with, because I like, obviously you've done, um, your (laughs) research, you've gone out and you've like talked to all the restaurants and all that stuff. But as far as beer, getting the liquid out there, how have you done that? And how important do you think that will be prior to opening up? Yeah, so we have done a lot of stuff, and it's not necessarily, you know, kind of the first things that would pop into your mind about, like, how to go market a a service or a product to people. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have done everything from, um, you know, beer for friends, Christmas parties. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, my neighborhood had an event, and we were like, we'll just show up with, like, six kegs of beer and do all the alcohol for the event for free. Um, you know, we've done a bunch of charity events, a um, bunch of fundraiser type stuff that we've put beer into. Um, and then we do, you know, obviously social media is huge um, for breweries. That's how you're really, you know, hitting your demographic most of mm-hmm. the time. Um, and so we, you know, we try to post stuff frequently. Um, we do can giveaways. Um, yep. So we've I see got a lot a of that happening. Like list that we keep. Um, and it's basically every beer that we make, we'll, you know, can 40 cans of it and we'll draw 20 names off the mailing list and each of those people gets two cans um, of beer to pick up. And so it's given us the ability to kind of get our beer in front of people. Um, You know, and part of it is too, if I'm going to hang out with people that I know drink, I'm just going to bring beer. Um, I'm not going anywhere without beer. Um, You know, I pretty much carry (laughs) it. Put that on a (laughs) t-shirt. Honestly. a t-shirt V2. Yeah, I'm going nowhere without beer. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much always have beer. And so, you know, a lot of it is to, 
you know, the, the thing that we found is beer is interesting to people, but people don't necessarily know a ton about beer. <clears throat> you know, they may know, like, I like IPAs. Okay, cool. They don't know how beer's made. They don't know, you know, what, what it looks like behind the scenes. And that's right. why like, brewery tours and things like that are always fun because you get that glimpse. But, For sure. you know, to me, when you go into a small brewery and you can sit down across the bar from the actual brewer and talk to them about you know, how'd you come up with the name for this beer? You know, why mm. did, why did you choose that flavor? Like, what was the, what was the story behind that? Um, it gives you a glimpse into like the inner workings of it, if you will. Yeah. And I think people find that really interesting. Um, and so a lot of what we've tried to do is just talk to people. Um, you know, like if, if people randomly message our Facebook page, you know, a lot of businesses would be like, we're not open yet. You know, we'll be open on this day. Come and see us when we're open. Thanks. Bye. Yep. Like, I actually carry on like conversations with people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we've had people come over to my house and homebrew with us, um, you know, that have reached out, just kind of interested in the brewery. And so, um, you know, part of it is just, it's, you know, it's definitely a passion for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why Mark and I are doing it. It's, it's not really a, you know, this is how we're going to get rich and become independently wealthy. And my kids yeah. will never have to work. Like that's yeah. not the idea behind it. Um, if it it's was usually we'll... not the idea behind any brewery, yeah. I feel like yeah. <laughs> um, we wouldn't be opening a three and a half barrel brewery in spring. <laughs> behind it. Um, you know, it's, it's more about, we love to do this. We love to drink yeah. beer. With people. We love to talk about beer. Um, and so to us, you know, this is, it's, it's fun. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that was part of the core concept originally is, like this should never cease to be fun. Um, right. If it does, then we're doing it wrong. For sure. um, you know, the, and the way that we keep it fun is, you know, we don't make the same 10 beers over and over again. You no. know, we, we may brew, you know, every weekend for four months in a row and not brew the same beer twice. Yeah. Um, you know, we're constantly putting out new stuff. We're constantly experimenting with things. We know lots of people in the industry, thankfully. And so we're, constantly talking to other people about new processes that they're using and ideas that we have for new processes and new ingredients and always kind of pushing the envelope a little bit um, to try to do something different. And I think it's when we first started doing it, people were just kind of like, oh, that's weird. Um, But now that they've had a chance to try some of those beers that we've pushed the envelope on, people are starting to get it and starting to get really excited about it. Um, Mm -hmm. We did a beer right after Halloween that had Sour Patch Kids in it. Um, And when we first announced it, people were like, try that. I think I might have tried that beer. (laughs) You did. (laughs) It's Um, really good. People people were like, oh, that's that's just kind of maybe that's a little too weird. (laughs) Um, And then when people had it, they're like, oh, never mind. Like you need to make this beer year round. Um, You know, we we sent a couple of cans of it to who we think is going to be our distributor. Um, Like once we go into distribution and uh, she sent me a message back and said, hey, I took it in and let my staff try it. And they said that you have to make more of this beer that they're obsessed with. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I will randomly get messages from her that are like, man, this beer, like you guys, when this comes out, are going to be so set. Like I can sell this beer everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially some of our core beers, you know, because right now, like the trend in craft breweries is like, you know, New England IPAs, big pastry stouts, fruited mm-hmm. stouts. But like, you know, how many breweries are doing a really good American Amber or a really good like base American Porter? Mm-hmm. People still love those beers. And there is a niche in the market. Um, our cream ale is like it's a super simple beer. Um, but we did it for a batch of it for a fundraiser like two weeks ago um, and put it alongside some really like high profile beers from some big commercial breweries yeah. and people are like, yeah, this beer kills like this. Beer kills. <laughs> um, you know, and so stuff like that. And the cool thing about a beer like that. So, you know, a cream ale, super simple beer. If you brewed it with lager yeast instead of ale yeast, it's essentially Budweiser. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's essentially an American lager just brewed yep. with an ale yeast. And so like, if you can get, you know, guy in the F two fifty that has, a, a mullet and a trucker cap on that's never had anything but you know bud light in his life if i can get him in the door and get him to try that beer he'll never drink bud light again because right. my beer tastes fresher it tastes crisper it's made on site 
like unless the price is a driving factor for him, which yep. some beer drinkers it is, mm-hmm. um, he's never going to go back just because I'm going to be able to provide a superior product to him. Yeah. Um, and so we have to have some beers like that in our rotation because of the size of the city and the the people that we're, uh, you know, that we're trying to reach out to and kind of connect. But the thing is, if I can get him in to drink cream ale three or four times and then I can pour him a sample of our, you know, our India Pell lager that we just did. Yeah. And then if I can get him to be like, oh, man, that's actually pretty good. Then I can get him to try our IPA. Try and like next thing you know, he's drinking like 14 and a half percent barrel aged stouts with <laughs> coconut marshmallow in them. It's a slippery slope, man. <laughs> I have fallen down it before. Kids. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, out of nowhere, they just start popping up the 1.8 of them. Yeah. Um, so probably uh, the last question that I have for our questions, you guys, again, I'm sorry you haven't been able to ask anything, um, but <laughs> what, the, yeah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, so do you think long term – we like to ask all of the breweries that come on how has bre- or ha- how has COVID affected you? Do you think being in your position that long term, I think COVID is going to be, this is my personal, so I'm not trying to lead you or anything as a lawyer might or something. Um, do you think that COVID will help breweries and like smaller businesses long term? I'll give, I'll let you answer first, but. I think so, Um, you know, and and for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, there's been a definite focus placed on supporting small businesses as part of COVID because the, you know, the concern was like Walmart's not going to go out of business because of COVID. Kroger isn't going to go out of business because of COVID. But what's going to happen is every little mom and pop store in your town and every locally owned restaurant and all that's what's going to fail first. Mm -hmm. And if your city doesn't have any of that stuff what do you have, man? Like you got Applebee's and TGI Fridays and Walmart, like congratulations. You're every other town in all of America. And like, there's nothing that makes you a community at that point. And so I think the focus that's been put on small businesses to try to help counteract some of that, some of that'll stick. Um, You know, some of those people, once COVID's over, are going to go back to eating it chilies every Friday night, but some of those people are going to stick to like going to a locally owned restaurant and, you know, spreading their money around town. Mm -hmm. Um, and then with us specifically, because of the timing around our opening, you know, so if we get open in late summer, so you've probably had kind of full vaccine rollout at that point, things have been open for a month or two, everybody's starting to feel more comfortable that this isn't like, hi, gotcha. COVID's back. Um, (laughs) things will hopefully start to be getting back to normal. And so everybody is going to be wanting to get out and go do stuff. And so I think we're going to open at a perfect time, you know, just from a selfish standpoint where like everybody's going to be looking to get out and do stuff anyway. And like, oh yeah, by the way, there's a new brewery in town. Um, And so we're, we're hoping that we get some, you know, short-term benefit from it, but I think long-term it is going to have impact. Um, At least I hope so. And for most of the people I talk to, that seems to be kind of the sentiment for most people. Well, that was the that was where the idea kind of came from. I think long term, this will really, really kind of be a turning point, hopefully, for a lot of people. But like, there has been such a push for small businesses, and like, my um, my I went to a birthday dinner that my dad had uh, back in like February, and it was at Applebee's, and I was like, "What the fuck are we doing here? Like, why on earth? (laughs) You can go like five minutes in any direction and go somewhere and get like." a meal that's 10 times better and get like some whatever different stuff. And like, why on earth would we be here? And I like said that when we were at dinner, he's like, I don't know. I just like Applebee's, I guess it's like, I used, I used to work for Applebee's. So (laughs) same actually, I don't eat there anymore. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, once you, once you get in the back, uh, like behind the kitchen, I think big daddy dropped off. Um, once you get back behind the kitchen and see how the, uh, you know, how everything works, you don't really want to go back. So, Totally agree. Big Daddy JJ, what do you guys have? I'm well, sorry. So No, you're good. Uh, so question for you, Brett. You've talked a lot about your homebrew batches out of your garage and, you know, all the kind of the events you've done with them as far as promoting, as far as giveaways, things of that nature. Are you selling some of that stuff right now? How's that going? What does that look like? Yeah, so we don't sell anything um, aside so from smart. t-shirts. Um, like that's the only thing that we sell. 
Um, so alcohol is a super heavily regulated industry. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the way the rules are kind of written around homebrewed beer, you can make homebrewed beer. You, ha- you technically have a limit on how many gallons you can make a year, but, um, but you can give it to friends. You can take it to charity events. Like there are certain things that you can do with it, which is essentially all the stuff that we're doing with it. Yep. Um, but you, you can't sell it. So um, even if you're like a registered brewery, you still wouldn't be able to? Not not stuff that you homebrew, no. So your your brewery licensing is tied to your specific brewery location, okay. um, which sucks in some ways because so like with us, when we're opening, so we're going to open, we're going to get our brewery licensed. If I am immediately looking to expand and that expansion involves moving to a different building, Yep. I got to go through the licensing process all over it. Oh, oh man. I can keep running my original brewery while I'm doing it. So like, it's not like I have to shut down, but like I will have to do the legal and regulatory side of things all over again um, in order to open a different brewery. And so there are a lot of commercial brewers that still homebrew. Um, you know, they find it a good way to like experiment with stuff and just mm-hmm. do some things that maybe you wouldn't want to do on a big commercial system. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of commercial brewers that still compete in home brewing competitions because they just like the competitive aspect of it. Um, you know, so we may have some stuff like that that we still do, but you know, none of that stuff that'll go on like my kegerator at my house. Um, you know, that sort of thing, or it'll I'll can up twenty cans of it and just send it out to friends or something like that. It'll be uh, it'd be pretty pretty limited, um, and. You know, I, I doubt I'll brew as much at home um, once we open just from a time perspective, because brewing is pretty much a it's almost a fixed task where it doesn't matter if you're brewing five gallons or 500 gallons. It takes roughly the same amount of time, right. um, you know, and so once you get to a point where you're making beer like hundreds of gallons at a time, going back and doing five gallons feels um, <laughs> kind of wasteful, kind of wasteful, um, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's it's a it's a weird feeling, but we just we actually shipped off a bunch of cans earlier this week to a national homebrew competition, um, which will take place in about a month. Um, and this will probably be the last time that we enter um, yeah. NHC um, just because after this will be uh, we'll be probably more for, focused on the commercial side of things. But that means then we'll be entering beers into uh, Great American Beer Festival and yep. Craft Brewers Conference and. Um, New York International Beer Festival and and some of the uh, the legit big competitions um, that oh, like I just have a feeling they're going to succeed at those. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope so, man. We've uh, we definitely put a lot of research in this stuff. Um, I'm kind of a nerd anyway, and so yeah. I, I read a lot of books. And um, you know, it's it's helpful that we've got friends in the industry because we've got people that we can ask questions to. Um, you know, it's, it's especially good when friends in the industry include breweries like Pontoon and Zool and breweries that like are some of the biggest breweries in the Southeast, um, and some of the most sought after beer in the Southeast. Um, you know, this Pontoon is is like, that is certainly helpful, man. Yeah. They just, um, so I think it was New York International Beer Festival was just a couple of weeks ago and Pontoon took five golds at New York International. <laughs> they're not stupid. Um, they are. I mean, they're some of the best beer that I've ever had. All of the stuff that I get from you, I uh, I love. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna make it a point when we're down there for the grand opening. I'm gonna try to get over there, yeah. make the trip. Um, and Sean's just an awesome dude. Um, oh yeah, we had it, him on. It's always cool to support businesses where like you like their products, but it's even cooler when you know that the person at the helm of it is like a genuinely awesome person for sure. Um, and Sean is one of the most genuinely awesome people that I know. Um, he's just a, he's a super cool guy. And boy, you're not going to get to know like the CEO of Applebee's. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you'd want to, man. No, I don't think you would either. Trash like him on this episode. Your- <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, sips Cabernet. Like, yeah, he doesn't sound like the kind of guy I want to hang out with. Anyway. No, definitely won't be drinking a beer. <laughs> Any anything else from you guys? Should we move on to listener questions? I mean, we still have a lot of those. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big Daddy's been so quiet. I feel bad. I, well, how about this? Let's roll through good. listener questions. You want to take the lead off? 
there, Big Daddy? Sure, let me read third person. <laughs> <laughs> so this this first one, we got a shout out, um, Bucky Booze. They wanted to make sure to get a listener question in because they're from Nashville, Brad. So I think oh, they'll nice. be at your grand opening. Awesome. Um, when we're down there, they're uh, super good friends with us. Go follow them at Bucky Booze. We're, uh, we're real tight with them. Anyway. I'm pretty sure I could actually answer this question, but... <laughs> I so the question read it. You know what? Why not take the lead on this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll that just go through the list of questions. Yeah, 11 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I, the question, I just the, so I saw the I saw the question when it was whatever. Um, they gave us the question: Why do we have to pump the keg? Like I don't get it. So I. <laughs> I, as soon as I read it, I thought it was the stupidest question I've ever heard. But I kind of get what they're asking. Hopefully they don't listen to this part. No. The, the more, they the just more drop I off. think about it, the more but no, it's I a better, legitimately... It's a better question. It's a better question than I thought. Because it's yeah. like, you pump it so the beer comes out. But like, yeah. but then like why do the, you have to? Doesn't the air spoil like, the beer? Well, Brad. Goes, yeah, Brad's, Brad. The, Brad's the beer. Yeah, yeah no. JJ's got it spot on, man. So, so there are two different ways, really, that you can get beer out of a keg. I mean, obviously, the way that breweries do it is the keg is hooked up to a CO2 line. Yep. Um, and so as you pull the handle, it gives the beer room to escape and the pressure of the CO2 coming in forces beer out of the keg and, and through the tap. So essentially, when you're you know talking about the little ones, you the party taps, um, it's the same concept. But what you're doing is you're pumping air into them to create pressure so that when you open it, the pressure from the air pushes the beer out. But yeah. Oxygen is the enemy of beer. Yeah. Air is terrible for beer. So if you're having a party and you've got like a half barrel and you're going to kill that entire half barrel in the night, no big deal. Like it's not going to have time for the air to really affect the flavor of it. But yep. go to a party like that, only finish about half that keg, Enjoy wake it. up the next morning and like pump one up and pour it. And it's going to taste, it's already going to taste like shit. Yeah. Try it about three days later. That beer will taste like wet cardboard. It is completely oh. undrinkable. Um, oxygen is, and you can, and that's even with like macro lagers and stuff like that. If you want a really fun experiment, take a New England IPA and pour it into two glasses. So pour eight ounces of the can into one glass and eight ounces in the other. Go ahead and drink one of the eight ounces and like take a picture of it, you know, Look at the color of it. Look at, you know, smell the aroma of it. See what you think taste wise. Let that other one sit for about two hours so that it has exposure to oxygen. It will turn like five shades darker color. It hmm. will smell horrible and it will taste like cardboard um, because New England are the worst beer, beer style for oxidation. Yeah. They oxidize so fast. Um, so Boy, we, we, Bill Nye, we, did you not sell me on that experiment? I know. <laughs> yes, as much yeah. as I'd love don't, to don't do, do that. it with the New England you're really looking forward to. Get, <laughs> you, like, get your hands on easily. That's like yeah. just uh, it's a good decent beer, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna miss it when it's gone. Yeah, that so that was a good question. Hope, thank you very much. I yep, it wasn't as dumb as I thought it was. You guys can ask the rest now. <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'll go for the next one. So. What exactly is the difference between an imperial stout and a regular? This one was answered on the first one. I know that we yeah. the first time we were with you, but that's again just on YouTube. You got to look a little harder for it. I was gonna say yeah. I I only know this answer because of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so anytime you start hearing words like imperial or double or triple, um, it's gonna refer to the ABV of the beer. Um, and so a, a traditional stout may only be in like the five to six percent range. Um, but typically once it crosses seven is when it's considered imperial. Um, so basically it's just it's a boozier version. Um, same way with IPAs, like you'll see IPAs that just say IPA and then you'll see ones that say, you know, double IPA, triple IPA. So um, there are no hard and fast rules for where those lines are. And some breweries play kind of fast and loose with them. But mm -hmm. the general consensus is once it crosses 7%, it's a double. And once it crosses 10%, it's a triple. Dang. But there's no word for, like, if it's if it's a stout, there's no, I think that, that it just goes from, like, a stout to an imperial, right? I think yeah, that's stout, what dude, we... Stout, yeah. There's nothing, there's no, okay. yeah. So, imperial and double are essentially interchangeable. Mm -hmm. It's just the style that you're talking about 
kind of varies as to which one you use. Um, you will occasionally see a can that says Imperial IPA. Mm-hmm. You don't often, most people just call them double IPAs. Mm-hmm. Um, but like double stout sounds weird. Yeah. Whereas Imperial stout sounds fancy. Um, <laughs> and so that may be what drives it is like, it's just a branding thing, but. Stout um, does kind of feel like a pinky out kind of beer. Yeah, so adding yeah. Imperial. <laughs> yeah. Imperial. Can we call it like the emperor? Is yeah. there, is there a term for a triple yeah. other than a triple? What gets higher than Imperial? I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, usually godly. And, and really the only thing Just you ever godly stout on is IPAs. Um, you hard because even if you have a stout that's 12 or 13 percent, it's still just an imperial stout. Yeah. Um, you still don't see them referred to as anything different. But pe- people love to talk about triple IPAs. Um, mm-hmm. We've got a brewery locally that makes a really good triple IPA. Um, and man, it's like it's smooth. It's boozy as fuck. Um, it will get the job done if you buy a four pack of it for sure. Yep. So go back if you're listening and you are a beer nut. Go back and listen. You have to go to YouTube and look up Feeling Lucky Common Law Brewing. And mm-hmm. that's our first episode. We I, I listened back to it today just because I didn't want to I wanted to make sure we didn't like double up questions. But um there was it was like I loved listening back to it today. It's just like it was a good baseline for us that was called craft beer for dummies and we're still dummies, but um, it's a little Man, craft more. We're a little craft further beer, though, is it, it's one of those things that like, if you just want to learn the basics of craft beer, like you can pick up the basics pretty quick, but like, yeah. it's a rabbit hole, man. Like how far down it do you want to dive? Um, sure. Cause like if you want to start getting into like, you know, being able to look at an IPA and tell whether you're going to like it or not based on the flavors of the hops that are in it. Like all it takes is a little research and you can do it. But, you know, most people don't have the, uh, the desire or the patience or the uh, base level of nerdiness to, to to do that sort of thing. Um, And so it's just a matter of like knowing enough about beer to where you can walk into a brewery and order something that you're going to like. That's really what most people should be targeting is, you know, a good sense of like, here's what it means. You know, if, if I walk into a brewery and they have 14 styles of beer, mm-hmm. knowing at least enough about those styles to know I'm probably not going to like that beer, I'll probably like that one. Yeah. Um, that's what most people are really kind of targeting. For sure. Uh, and it was like, it was a good baseline for the hour that we had with Brad. It wasn't like we didn't d- dive too deep into it, but it's yeah. good stuff. Big Daddy, you guys keep asking these questions. You got the next one there? Hmm? You know, <laughs> are you falling asleep up there? It's like breaking up really bad. Oh, oh okay. Right. Well, ask the next question if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. I, oh, you don't have it up. Never mind. No, well, I he's grabbing it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I couldn't. Time. The interference from your actual voice. Oh. Here, and then this was a little, little choppy. Confusing. I couldn't hear you. Some, Sorry. That's what I was some like. struggle bus. <laughs> He's been just looking blankly at the screen for the past <laughs> 50 minutes. <laughs> so just loving the conversation and Big Daddy has not. It's been stone faced. It's all right. Take <laughs> no. your time. So uh, I think you sort of addressed this one already. But the question that's next here says, where does he, meaning Brad, see beer going next? Hazy and fruited are the case are the crazes now, but where do we go from here? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, did you answer that? I don't think you answered. No, well, you talked about it. Yeah, I think I've talked about bit, yeah. like you know trendy styles and stuff. But yeah. um, so hazies, I don't think are going anywhere. Um, you know, I'm I, either. I, I'm a haze bro. Yeah, when they first popped up and really got big a couple of years ago, people were like, oh, this is a one summer fad. Like, this is going to die. And, like, they just keep getting more and more popular and more and more market share. So I don't think Uh cases are going anywhere. Um, I do think you're going to start to see some drop off in, like, pastry stouts and stuff like that. Um, You know, I've I've noticed already breweries are kind of cutting back a little bit on that stuff and not just pumping out as many of them. you know, I would like to see from for the stout scene, I would like to see the stout scene return to just really good non adjuncted barrel aged stouts where it's like you've got to make a good stout. You got to pick a good barrel to pair it with. You got to pull it at exactly the right time. And then, you know, I'm a I'm a there is actually a beer that the name it's a, a barrel aged stout that the name of the beer is beer barrel time. 
because to <laughs> me, that's what makes a really good barrel aged stout is just the beer, the barrel, and the time that it spends in there. If you're having to dump, you know, nine metric tons of marshmallows and 74 Madagascar vanilla beans into it to make it taste good afterwards, you probably shouldn't have made the beer to begin with. Right. Um, you know, and so my rule of thumb is um, if a brewery will not release their base stout for sale, I will not buy their adjuncted stouts um, because I do not trust that their base stout is very good. Because wow, that's a really good rule of thumb. Um, so I, I think those are going to trail off. Um, I don't think fruited sours are going anywhere anytime soon just because fruited sours have an appeal to a segment of the market um, that you can't always catch with IPAs. Um, so mm-hmm. people that like the flavor of ciders um, you know, are, are going to, you know, the easiest thing to switch them over to is fruited sours. Um, you know, the, the groups that I'm in, um, the ladies that are in the groups tend to gravitate a little more towards fruited sours. And so I think breweries see that as a good way to kind of diversify the demographics that are coming into their, their tap room a little bit. So I think you'll see those hang around. Um, I do hope that you'll start to see more of them without lactose in them. Um, you know, there for a while, every fruited sour had tons of lactose in it to keep it sweet on the finish. I would like to see some go back to a little bit more pure form sour that doesn't necessarily get loaded down with a ton of lactose. Mm. Um, but I think the big, the thing that you're going to see start coming back around and it's already starting is you're going to start seeing a ton more traditional lagers, um, whether it's like German pills, a nice American light lager, a nice Czech lager. Um, it's funny. We do a, Sch- a Schwartz beer, which is a German black lager. And uh, we I think I had, had that one, didn't I? Yeah, we had done a batch of it. And, uh, you know, we, we were about to, like, do our release for it and start sending it out to people. And, like, right as we're about to, Southern Grist, various artists, and, like, five other Nashville breweries, like, in one week, all released a Schwartz beer. That's crazy. <laughs> and we're like, what the hell? And it's funny, too, because it's not like... You know, a New England IPA, I can make a New England IPA, have it in cans and release it in like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, a Schwartz beer, because it has to lager, you know, I'm talking, you know, two, two and a half, maybe three months from the yeah. time I get to the time it releases. So it's not like they could hear that somebody else was doing one and we're like, oh, yeah, we should do one of those, too, and just snuck it in there. Right. It didn't really work that way. And so I think when you see things like that happening, it's indicative of trends that mm-hmm. are coming. Um, you know, even the beer that I'm drinking tonight, I mean, Southern Grist is known for their fruited sours and their big pastry stouts, but this is a French style Pilsner. Um, you know, I think you're going to see more and more of that, um, which I'm glad. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I like to drink. Um, I think the other thing that you're going to start seeing is I think people are getting a little burnt out on the doubles and triples and big Imperials. Yeah. I think you're going to start seeing beers drop more back into the session range. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you see a lot of 4% beers coming out and even some of the bigger beers staying in the five and a half to 6% range instead of floating yeah. up seven or 8% range. Um, you know, it's, is it cool to sit down and have an 8% IPA? Yeah. But if I want to have more than two beers, would I much rather have a four and a half percent pale ale? Yeah. Cause then I'm not going to feel like trash the next morning. Yep. No, that was one of my favorite takeaways from our first interview that we did with you. Um, you, we're pretty big on if your local brewery has a really good lager that mm-hmm. you should really support it and buy it because it takes a lot of time. And that was something that I had no idea. So a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of effort and people don't realize too, you know, people think about, so if you take the American light lager, I mean, it's the most ubiquitous beer in the United States It's probably the first beer that all of us had at some point. Mm-hmm a Bud Light or a Coors Light or whatever. Light. And, you know, people like to kind of shit on the the macro beers, you know, because they think it's all brand and hype and marketing. But there's a reason that American Light Lager is the most popular style of beer in the United States, because it's easy drinking. It doesn't fill you up. It's not super boozy. You can have a, a few of them without feeling bad. Um, and they're not the easiest beer to make. Um, they take time. There's nowhere to hide anything in them. So if you make a lager that's bad, it's not like you can add, you know, marshmallow to it and cover up the badness or chocolate or whatever, like you can in a stout or a sour, you know, you're stuck with it. Um, Like it is when the beer is made, it is what it is. And Mm -hmm. like 
you know, if you did a crappy job and you have to wait two and a half months to find out you did a crappy job and then you have to dump it anyway, like <laughs> it's a horrible feeling. Yeah. Can't even imagine. Ever since you told that, told us that the first time uh, we talked, that's the first type of beer I look for on a new brewery's menu. Just because yeah. if they have it, I want to try it to yeah. know like how they are as a brewery. Yeah. 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 It, if they can do a good rule of thumb, they can do loggers really well. It's it's just it's a technical style that takes some experience and some knowledge to be able to do really well. Um, you know the the big breweries have some advantages um, just b- based on their scale. Um, it makes it a little easier. A lot of people don't realize, but they they brew these massive batches of beer and then they run full technical specs on all of the beer, so they know like this batch is five point one percent alcohol with twenty one IBUs and you know, has this density to it. They know everything about the beer. And then they know like, you know, our beer should be, you know, 5.26% with 22 and a half IBUs in this level of body. And so what they do is they have a blender whose only job is to take the scientific data from the tanks and back blend the tanks together to make the perfect version of that beer by taking different batches and combining them. Um, that's why like Bud Light always tastes exactly the same mm-hmm. because they're able to back blend and do a bunch of things to, to the taste of it. The more, you know, holy crap. That's yeah, pretty wild. Actually, when you think about it for sure, let's keep plugging along. We've had Brad for longer than <laughs> I'm sure you signed up for, but we've got a, we've got a couple more. Um, kid, so. <laughs> okay. so, Oh, we got all night. Um, I'll do the next. Uh, what's the craziest beer you've ever made, and was it a bust or a win? Ooh, um, I would say that 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 coconut lime curry goza is is probably right up there at the top, um, in in terms of just sheer craziness. Because you know, throwing a bunch of fruit into a beer is one thing, but like starting to mix in spices and random stuff like that, you're you're taking yeah. it to another level. So that one's that one's pretty wild. Um. I'm not going to, I'm not willing to say that it's a, a home run yet. Um, I need <laughs> Until we try it at first, but yeah, I think it's going to be pretty good. Um, I made a rum raisin oatmeal cookie stout a couple of years ago. Um, okay. that was, was really good. So I took, um, a bunch of Thompson seedless raisins and like rough chopped them and covered them in Myers dark rum and mm. put a couple of cinnamon sticks and some cacao nibs in it and let it soak for about four days. Um, and then drained all that and and threw it into a stout. Um, the thing straight up tasted like oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, so it, it was it was definitely a huge hit. Um, the barrel aged stout that we have out right now, um, not a super wild beer, but yeah, definitely a, a massive hit. And it was the craziest thing with it. We we got a very small barrel from a local distiller. I was um, going to ask what you which got, was, which was kind of cool. So there's a right up the street from us in Thompson station, there's a distillery called H Clark <clears throat> and they do a whiskey called black and tan mm-hmm. uh, that the whiskey itself has chocolate malt in it, which is the malt in stouts that usually give them their dark color. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically the whiskey is a stout turned into a whiskey. Um, and so we got one of those barrels and aged a like 12 and a half percent Imperial stout in it. And man, like, you know, talk about like chocolate, you know, little hints of vanilla, little hints of caramel, tons of barrel flavor, nice warm booziness to it. Like it's, it's a really, really good beer. Um, yeah, that sounds so good. The Sour Patch Kid beer we did was pretty that wild. Was super good. Uh, I never thought I would throw Sour Patch Kids into a bull kettle. Um, what did just, you call it again? I don't it remember. Just instantly, Custody Battle. Custody Battle. Yep, I remember. <laughs> it. Yep, that was good. Very good. Everybody fights over who keeps the kids. <laughs> You guys want yeah, to so we're on? actually we're doing that beer again. Um, not that same variety, um, but we're doing a, a different take on it. Hold on, I can tell you. I'm brewing it June something. Um, June. I got my calendar in front of me, so. Uh, oh, I'm still in May. That's why I don't see it. June 5th. I'm brewing a version of that beer again, and it will be released on the 4th of July. Uh, uh, so we are doing it with uh, with red, white, and blue Sour Patch Kids. Oh, I love uh, it. And, and the fruit in it this time is going to be um, 
raspberry, strawberry, and pineapple. God, that just sounds... Oh. Boy, does that have it to make its way up to us. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't know who, what we got to do. I would do some nasty things for that, though. Yeah, we can, we can probably we can probably figure out how to how to get that up there. Um, the uh, the other one, I thought it was all gone, and I found one can of it hidden in like the back of my fr- fridge the other day. And I was like, "Holy shit, this is like the last can of this beer in existence." <laughs> um, we will definitely do that one again. That was one where um, the the reaction that we got from people to it was just so good that yeah, you know, we'd be dumb not to not do it again. Right, yeah. um, we did a couple of pie sours recently for for pie day. They kind of got the same reaction. Um, I got a a text message from our um, distributor that just said this peach gooseberry pie is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stupid. It's just stupid. It's a great reaction. <laughs> uh, but yeah, mm. that, and and that's what we're looking for out of stuff like that. And and we've definitely I've made some weird beers where like they weren't they bad. Missed. They did not turn out how I thought they would. Yeah. Um, I will I will be the first person to admit that. But then I've also made some that didn't turn out how I thought they would. They actually turned out better than what I was aiming for. Right. Um, so it really just depends on what you're doing. The the New England IPA we do with Fruit Loops in it. Um, the first time we did it was kind of as a joke. Um, mm-hmm. And then we served it to a handful of people and people were like, holy shit, this is delicious. <laughs> Um, yep. and so that's actually on my brewing schedule. Um, I think I had that one too, didn't I? It tasted like, like the milk after Fruit Loops. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was like, yeah, like, yeah I did. Yeah, oh, that's boy. one of, that's one of our serial killer beers. Yep. Yep. I remember all that. Um, you guys want to go get the next, there's two that link up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll do these together. So quite, or part one is. What are your personal favorite hops and your favorite style of beer? And then the follow-up to that is if you could only use one hop for the rest of your brewing career, what would it be? Oh, man. That's uh, <laughs> that's really tough. So in terms of personal favorite hops, um, I'm a really big Nelson Sauvin fan. Um, it's probably my, my singular favorite hop. Um, it works really well in lots of stuff. It has some really interesting flavor notes to it. Um, we use it in a, a ton of beers um, just because where, I like it so much. Where does that come from? Uh, Nelson Sauvin is New Zealand. Gotcha. It's a New Zealand hop. So mm-hmm. um, big fan of that one. Um, also a big fan of uh, Rowaka, which is another New Zealand hop. Um, Citra, obviously, you know, talk, getting into some of the U.S. hops. Um, this was kind not- of where... The hop, I like that's we need to have you on for an episode of that because I feel like hops are such a big thing that I know almost nothing about when and it comes the, to brewing, but I just want to. The easiest way to do it would be um, I could give you a list of like 12 uh, to 15 uh, hops yeah. that would probably account for like 90% of the IPAs you're ever going to yep. see. Um, and if you understand what those 10 or 15 hops taste like and how they work together you could pretty much guess the flavor profile of, of just about any IPA. So we'll um, just get 12 to 15 beers that have those hops in them and have yeah. you on and go through all of them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so those, those are probably, um, you know, kind of some of my personal favorite hops. Um, I, I do have hops that I just don't like. Um, I've got some specific hops that I just don't care for. Um, uh, it's blasphemy in the beer world, but I'm not a big fan of Mosaic. Um, really? What? I just don't really like it. Um, there's oh. just something about the flavor profile that tastes weird um, to me. It has almost like an ammonia type flavor to it, like a okay. real sub ammonia flavor to me. But, um, you know, everybody's taste buds are different. Um, obviously, Mosaic is a super popular. Yeah, I was gonna um, say, I am, like I most the, of what I drink. I'm in the super minority. We still use it. Um, I still work it into stuff because I know other people like it, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm not dumb enough to think that if I don't like a beer, it means nobody else can possibly right. like a beer. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. And you know, even kind of the the definition that we give people behind common law, you know, so common law in the legal sense of the term is, is judge made law essentially. So it's when a judge interprets a statute um, and then that becomes kind of binding on people. 
Um, we think of beer the same way, but like our patrons are the judges. So like if I make a beer and I love it, but everybody we serve it to is like, no, nah, dude, <laughs> don't do this one again. We're not making that beer again. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas if we make one that I'm only, you know, moderately happy with and everybody loves it, which has happened. Um, we had one beer that we served at a tailgate literally mark had to talk me off a ledge of just dumping the keg oh like, geez. I, I hated it that much <laughs> and he's like dude i'm telling you you're being overly bad. critical on it it's not that bad and yeah. we took it to a tailgate and the five gallon keg kicked in like 45 minutes Jesus, um, like it went in no like people loved it and we're asking us yeah. if we have more of it so it it happens um and then i think the other one the other part of the question that was on there was my favorite, my personal favorite style. Um, I am a big fan of sours, um, but not kettle sours, like actually spontaneously fermented barrel, yeah. it's like old world sours, um, especially some of the less fruited um, farmhouse style beers. Um, so a good Saison, a good Grisette, um, you know, some of, some of those styles, you don't see them a ton. Um, luckily we've got a local brewery that makes grisette on a fairly frequent basis. And he jokes every time I'm in there that I'm the only person that comes in specifically to drink grisette. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a great style, man. They're, they're crisp. They're refreshing. They have a little bit of it. to them that gives them some depth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it, it's a nice balance between like a 4% beer that's crisp and refreshing, but still has like some really complex flavor to it. Um, yeah. Definitely, uh, definitely a style that I would recommend. Um, and then if I could only ever use one hop and that would be, uh, that would be super tough. Um, it, you know, my, my first inclination would be to go with something like Centennial, um, because Centennial makes a great bittering hop. It's got a good aroma to it. It's got a good flavor to it. It can kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, which is why Centennial, especially in like West Coast IPAs and stuff, you see it in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, our Pell Ale is always made with Centennial. So we do a, a two hop Pell Ale where one hop rotates every okay. time we do it, but the other hop is always Centennial. Um, but it's because it's got a great flavor. It's super versatile. It does exactly what we need it to do. So I'd say if I had to stick with one, it would probably be Centennial. Um, you know, my, my first inclination and probably what a lot of people would be, you know, thinking is like, you know, going for Citra or something like that. Where you Yeah, that would have been my first pick. Dude, Citra, if you bitter beer with it, though, has this funky bitterness to it. Like it okay. just does not do well as a bittering hop. Yeah. Uh, whereas Centennial can do it all. It doesn't okay. matter. Um, you put Centennial in, you're going to get good flavor out of it. Nice. Very interesting. That's a good question. Whoever, that's a really good question. Whoever sent that one in, that's an awesome question. <laughs> um, I think that was Patrick, I want to say. Yeah. Maybe. I, I could see that being somebody that has a brewing background because yeah. that's, that's a very good uh, brewing from a technical perspective question. For sure. Um, this one, I guess probably could have been looped in there. We don't have to get like super in depth. It says how many different types of hops are there and does it matter <laughs> what you use in different types of beer? I don't know. Yeah. Sent this one. There, there are hundreds, um, and there are more coming out every year. Um, it's we, crazy. we need we to do a hops episode or something. Yeah, we always buy experimental hops every year of, of new crops that might or might not actually end up hitting the market. Um, we've had a couple that we just, I pray to God they make it to production cause they're yeah. really, really good. Um, we just used one, um, a couple of weeks ago in a beer that's, um, HBC 692, which is, a an experimental hop that just came out this year. And man, it's fantastic. Like, I it better make its way um, into the mainstream. But all of the main hops that you think of, like Citra and Mosaic, mm -hmm. those, at one point in time, they were an experimental hop. Right. Um, you know, Citra is like HBC 488 or something like that is the, the original code for it. So usually they'll be an experimental status for a couple of years until they can see, like, how much are people using them? Do people like it? What's the reaction to it? And if it's yeah. good, then they'll put it into production. And then the hop gets a certain run of production as a trademark hop where only certain farms can grow it. 
And then once that trademark expires, anybody can grow it and it becomes much more widely available and, and drives down the price of the hop, <laughs> um, which, which is nice. Um, you know, obviously some of that is also driven by what part of the world the hops come from. Um, you know, there are a ton of hops that come from the U.S. Um, there are a ton of European hops. There are a ton of South African hops, New Zealand, Australia. Um, you know, different parts of the world grow different styles of hops. Um, you know, most of the most of our hops here in the U.S. are either known for being real citrus forward or being piney. Um, okay. You know, most of the European hops are known for what's referred to as their noble character. They have a very light, um, you know, not super bitter, almost kind of a, a peppery kind of flavor to them. They're not super strong on alpha acids, which is what gives beer its bitter character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, New Zealand has a lot of tropical forward hops. South Africa has a lot of tropical and citrus forward hops. It, you know, you get a lot of stuff from around the world. But I mean, just just U.S. varieties of hops. Hell, there's probably like 60 or 70 of them. Yeah. Nice. Um, you don't have to answer to the second part. Does it matter what you use in different types of beer that yeah. obviously <laughs> it, 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 it does. And you also, you really have it just kind of a general perspective. You have three broad categories of hops. Mm -hmm. So you have bittering hops, which are exactly what they sound like. They're this, hops yeah. that are meant to go in early on to give beer its IBUs and its bitter character. You have aroma hop, which may not bitter well but they produce really great aromas and so they go in towards the end of the boil or in mm -hmm. dry hop because um, that's where most of your aroma comes from and then you have dual purpose hops that can do either of them really well um centennial falls into that that dual purpose category yeah nice um one more question this will be the last one thank you so much for your time yeah, man. way over um does glassware really matter when it comes to beer <laughs> Uh, yes, for a couple of reasons. Um, well, yes and no for, for a couple of reasons. Um, <laughs> I am not a firm believer that you have to have a certain style of glass for a certain style of beer. Um, okay. a, a tulip glass can be used to serve a Belgian or an IPA or a stout or wh whatever. Um, you know, are you going to get a little bit more hop aroma out of a certain shape glass? Yes. No. Is it worth having 19 different glasses in your cabinet to be able to take <laughs> advantage of that? No, yeah. um, it, it's not. As a brewery, is it worth having 10 different glasswares that you have to order and keep under your cabinet? No. You know, maybe you have two. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I will say, though, that is really important about glassware um, is it's got to be clean. And it's not clean in just like the sense of I ran it through the dishwasher. Um, there is a difference between a clean glass and a beer clean glass. Yeah. Um, and, and beer clean. I is, found that out a uh, thing from that, Hoppy Mommy. She yeah. grills me every time I post a picture and it's not a beer clean glass. Yeah. So if, if you pour a beer into a clean glass and you get adherence of bubbles to the mm -hmm. edge of the glass, that means your glass isn't clean. So what's happening is there are microscopic pieces of dirt on the inside of that glass. That's what the bubbles are catching on. And it yep. doesn't allow them to float all the way to the surface and form the head of the beer. Um, there is a really cool Instagram account called Untapped WTF. Um, <laughs> a really, really funny Instagram account that just posts bunches of stupid untapped check-ins. Yeah. Um, but they refer to those as flavor crystals. Um, nice. so if your beer has flavor crystals, not a good thing. They were, <laughs> they took the piss out of Lagunitas the other day because Lagunitas on their official social media posted a beer in a glass that was clearly not a beer clean glass. Um, and we're like, dude, you guys are, you guys are way too big to be making amateur. <laughs> like that. Um, so yeah. glassware does matter in the sense that having a good clean glass to serve a beer out of is going to allow you to experience the beer in a much better fashion. Um, I always, I'm breaking my own rule tonight, but um, I always recommend that people pour their beer out into a glass, don't drink out of the can, um, especially if you have trouble with filling full or filling gassy from drinking beer. When you pour a beer into a glass, it helps to release some of the carbonation out of it. And so you're not intaking as much. Whereas if you drink it straight from the can, you're pretty much drinking all the carbonation in the beer. Um, what about what about Hetty Topper? Doesn't Hetty Topper on their can say to enjoy it, it, it from tells, the can? Yeah, it tells you to enjoy it from the can. Um, I, I've got Fuck a couple them. of I got a couple of opinions on why they do that. Um, 
one is a historical, you know, Hetty was kind of the, the first real hazy yep. IPA. At the time, hazy IPA wasn't a thing and was not acceptable. An IPA mm-hmm. was supposed to be clear. Um, and so I think they were telling people to drink it from a can to avoid so people to seeing see that. it wasn't clear. Um, it just became a part of the branding or something. Um, Hetty is also not, you know, from a, a volume of CO2 perspective, Hetty is not super bubbly. Um, for an IPA, it's on the the lower end of the scale. It, at least from my perception, drinking it, it feels like it's on the lower end of the scale of CO two. So, um, drinking it from a can is not going to get you as bad. Whereas if you're drinking something that's super high carb straight from the can, mm-hmm. like you're going to end up gassy just because of all the CO two in it. Whereas heady, you're not really going to have that problem with. But my guess would be it's a historical thing that plays back yeah. to the fact that the beer's hazy. Okay, interesting. Very, very interesting. I think, I mean, not I think. I know we're way over on time. So thank you so much, Brad. Can you plug everything that Common Law has? What do you have coming out? Um, Where can people find you? All that good stuff. Yeah, so we, um, the easiest way to find us, obviously, is uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, So if you just search for Common Law Brewing Company on Facebook or at Common Law Brewing on Instagram, um, those are our, our two main social media accounts. Um, we have a website um, as well, which is where we run our mailing list and everything off of. I try to keep it updated with a menu as well um, to give people an idea of what cans and stuff we've come out with recently or what we have coming out in the near future. So mm-hmm. if you're ever curious about like, hey, what's what's Brad done from a beer perspective lately? Check the website because it actually okay. does usually have some up to date information. Um, the website address is commonlaw.beer, um, which is. Them Hops making up here. URLs is the <laughs> biggest thing ever. Um, it's so, good. Yeah. So commonlaw.beer. Um, it's pretty easy to remember. Um, I am on untapped. Um, I tend to not check in a ton of beer on untapped um, because I try a lot of beer. I have a lot of people bring me beer samples and stuff. If I checked in all of them, I would look like a raging alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Not the impression that I'm looking to make on people, but um, if you want to add me as a friend on Untapped, it's BES753 um, on Untapped. I will be more than happy to not check in beers and let you watch. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so th- those are the easiest ways, um, you know, to follow us. Obviously, if you're relatively close, um, you know, to, to my area, you know, we do beer giveaways. We're at, you know, Bucky charity moves. events, Get in on that. sorts of festivals and stuff. So. Um, you can definitely come find us in the area. Um, I literally have people message me occasionally like, hey, man, anyway, I could get a beer. And I'm like, sure, here's my address. Come over and grab one. Um, <laughs> because at the end oh, of the day, like, I need people to drink my beer. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we we try to do our best to, to get it into the hands of the people that want to drink it. So um, I can surely find a way to get it to you if it's, uh, if it's something that you're truly interested in. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you again so much for all of your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, Brad will be on our our virtual tasting, and we're going to probably do segments after this. It's running long, so we'll try to keep it quick. But thank you again so much, Brad. It was a lot of fun. Um, Yeah, we're going to switch over to segments right now.